Soviet is no doubt one of the most powerful countries in the world, but have you ever wondered why didn't the Soviets build their Dark Star DSBLK? Let us find out. Hello friends, welcome back to Future Warplanes. Today we are back here again with an interesting fact. Today we'll discuss the reason why the Soviets did not build their Dark Star DSBLK. So stick with the video and watch until the end to know everything about it. Let us start with the video, but before that, please hit the bell icon and subscribe to the channel to get every single update about the channel. Imagine starting from scratch to develop an airplane, only to have your airline client cheat you, cause you to go bankrupt and have you burn the prototype only a few weeks before your maiden flight. The narrative of the Fairchild Dornier 728 presents the most intriguing what-if scenario in the field of regional aviation. You have to understand that the market for regional jets is a cutthroat one, and back in the early 2000s, several different companies were fighting to be the 737 of the market for aircraft with less than 100 seats. Bombardier of Canada, with its CRJ program, was located in one quadrant, while Embraer of Brazil, with its ERJ and E-Jet series, was located in the other quadrant. But there was one underdog company smack dab in the center that intended to rise up and grab it all, Fairchild Dornier, with a brand new family of aircraft known as the 728 series. This company was Fairchild Dornier. This aircraft would have been able to compete head-on with both the Airbus A220-100 and the Embraer competitor in the market for aircraft with a range of between 50 and 130 miles. Today, we will learn about the characteristics of the 728, which airline misled the builders, and finally, the reason why the 728 was never constructed. Let's explore. It wasn't with Fairchild that the narrative of the Fairchild Dornier 728 even began to unfold. In point of fact, it all begins with a completely different aircraft, the turboprop Dornier 328. The regional jet in question had a pair of propellers and was generally regarded as a serviceable but unremarkable piece of equipment. It was first developed as a contemporary response to the need for 30-seaters in the European market, and it was regarded as the most advantageous turboprop of the early 1990s. Because of its high cruising speed and altitude, it was able to match the efficiency of jet engines, yet use a substantially lower amount of fuel. It was successfully advertised all throughout Europe and in the western U.S. as being ideal for point-to-point -point travel in regional areas. In 1991, it was successful in securing a significant order for 35 aircraft with Horizon Air. At the time, this was the largest order for any turboprop aircraft of that class. You may be wondering why I said it wasn't thrilling. In the early 1990s, a regional jet, not a regional turboprop, was the most cutting-edge and popular mode of transportation in the area. The combination of this factor and a saturated turboprop market that had many more seats caused the firm to suffer significant financial losses. How much? Just in 1995, the German Dornier company was responsible for a loss of $337 million. So what was the answer to this problem? How might they make their already excellent turboprop seem more seductive? by throwing some turbojet engines on it. This new variant, which has the inventive name 328 Jet, would be able to exceed even the turboprop in terms of speed and would be the fastest regional jet available. Additionally, since Dornier had thoroughly over-engineered the first airplane, very little design work needed to be done on the first turboprop model. In fact, they were even able to install engines on it and start selling it right immediately because it was so well designed. The Fairchild Aircraft Company at the same time, the protagonist of our story, Fairchild Aircraft, arrives on the scene. This American company was responsible for developing the A-10 Warthog, a jet that became famous for the distinctive sound it made during the Gulf War. The company purchased the struggling Dornier and its 328 jet program, both of which were rather ambitious in their own right. Why, after all, concentrate on only the 30-seater market when what airlines really want is a 100-seater money-making machine? This is the conclusion that they reached the 728 series vehicles. The 728 series would take the aspects of the 328 jet program that were successful and make significant enhancements to those aspects. At the ILA Berlin Aerospace Show, International Aviation and Spaceflight Exhibition, which took place in Berlin on May 19, 1998, a new family of regional jets called the 528 jet, 728 jet, and 928 jet was introduced. These planes have seating capacities ranging from 55 to 100 passengers. Interestingly, this five-seating arrangement was at the request of Lufthansa, which didn't want a low-cost carrier to come in with the same plane, slap in six seats, and beat them in their own market. As you will see later, this was one of the choices that contributed to the downfall of the type, and was one of the reasons why it was discontinued. 
A further model, designated as the 200, was planned to be released with a greater MTOW of 3,000 kilograms, alternative engines, and an increase in range of 750 kilometers up to 3,300 kilometers. However, why should we stop there? Why not increase the length of the 728 to make it 928? The 928 featured a lengthened fuselage that would have allowed the aircraft to have a passenger capacity of between 95 and 110 seats, but it was never put into production. The wingspan of the 928 was enlarged, and the engines were made far more powerful. It was intended to produce both a 928-100 model and a 928-200 model, the latter of which would have an enhanced maximum takeoff weight and a range of 3,565 kilometers or 1,925 nautical miles. In conclusion, the group suggested reducing the size of the 728 to that of the 528 in order to bridge the gap between the 328, which is still in the process of being developed. The fuselage length of the 528 was supposed to be lowered to 23.38 meters, giving it a passenger capacity of between 55 and 65 seats and a range of 2,963 kilometers. There were also preliminary plans to move up to a second stretch named 1128 after they had controlled the sub-100 market. This aircraft would have had seating for up to 120 people and would have competed at the lower end of the market for Boeing 737s. There was also a variant of the business jet known as the Envoy 7, which did not need refueling even while flying from Europe to the U.S. Last but not least, Fairchild Dornier attempted to sell the aircraft to the military under the guise of an early warning aircraft and an air tanker for in-flight refueling. It was a huge success, and by June of 2001, it was announced that leasing company Gikas had placed a definite order for 50 aircraft with extra options for up to 100 aircraft. This was in addition to additional options for up to 100 aircraft. According to reports, as of the beginning of 2002, a total of eight customers, including Lufthansa City Line, Gikas, Bavaria Leasing, CSA Czech Airlines, Atlantic Coast Airlines, and Seoul Air, had placed a cumulative 125 firm orders for the type in addition to signing options for an additional 164 aircraft so close to the 200 that are required to make a profit. What came to pass? So, where did this outstanding lineup and all these orders go? Moving ahead in time to March 2002, the company announced that the program would be put on hold for two months as it searched for extra funding. This announcement came just two days before the 728 was scheduled to make its maiden trip around the airport on its own power. However, that additional money would never materialize, and by April of that same year, the aerospace constructor was forced to file for bankruptcy due to financial difficulties. Both Lufthansa and the aviation leasing company Gikas withdrew their support for the initiative, which essentially rendered it unprofitable. This was a significant setback for the effort to get further financing because the cabin could not be rearranged to accommodate high-density seating. Low-cost airlines that had shown interest at the time withdrew their interest, thanks to Lufthansa. In 2004, the engineers were forced to give up everything totally, including the three prototype aircraft that had never flown but were, in all other respects, ready for takeoff. Despite their best efforts, the engineers were unable to convince anyone else to continue funding the initiative. In the end, the three prototypes were either demolished or put to use in other areas of engineering. Their primary goal, however, was not to transport people but rather to serve as a cautionary tale to anybody else who may be interested in trying to break into the regional market. Okay, this video is over. Comment below and tell us what you think. To show your appreciation, click the like button and spread the video around. Please subscribe to our channel if you like this video and click the bell symbol to be notified when we upload new videos. Please enjoy the rest of the show.